This is part one of a two-part video series titled The IPCC Says. In 2007, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, published its fourth assessment report, and it's known as AR4. In the four years since then, it has been quoted, paraphrased, referenced innumerable times in TV and radio news reports, in newspaper and magazine articles, and in blog posts. Let's take a look at four of those quotes. Let's see what they sound like with a movie trailer voice. The observed patterns of warming and their changes over time are only simulated by models that include anthropogenic forcing. Whereas simulations that include only natural forcings do not simulate the warming observed over the last three decades. Clearly, the changes are not linear and can also be characterized as level prior to about 1915, a warming to about 1945, leveling out or even a slight decrease until the 1970s, and a fairly linear upward trend since then. Whoops, this one's going to be tough. Moderately good agreement. Mm. Modeling studies are also in moderately good agreement with observations during the first half of the 20th century when both anthropogenic and natural forcings are considered. Other than the frail phrase, moderately good agreement, the quotes from the IPCC sounded quite authoritative, especially with the movie trailer voice. But does the IPCC's data support the IPCC's claims? Let's take a look at those four quotes, those four arguments again. We can confirm one with the data. The other three really aren't valid arguments. With respect to the period of 1951 to 2005, the IPCC says, the observed patterns of warming and their changes over time are only simulated by models that include anthropogenic forcing. Now, when you think about that, that assumes that the models have shown that they have skill at reproducing temperature variations over the 20th century. Without that skill, the arguments really not valid. The IPCC provided a graph of global surface temperature anomalies to support their claim. This graph compares observations, instrument-based observations, and climate model results where the models have been forced with natural and anthropogenic forcings. The black curve, those are the instrument-based observations. The yellow curves, all those nice little yellow wiggles, those are 58 ensemble members, computer model runs, from 14 coupled climate models. The red curve, that's the multi-model ensemble mean, the average of all those yellow squiggles. What the uh, multi-model mean represents. And we think about each climate model run, known in a, as an ensemble member, it has two components, the forced signal and the random signal, which is really noise generated by the computer program. Since the random components are random, they don't correlate with one another. So when you average enough of those ensemble members, the result is the forced component. Basically, what the multimodal ensemble mean represents is the IPCC's best guess estimate of the modeled response 
to the natural and anthropogenic forcings. Now we'll move on to quote number two, and it was the one that concluded, whereas simulations that only include natural forcings do not simulate the warming observed over the last three decades. It's kind of reliant on quote number one. It also assumes, in order for it to be valid, that the climate models have shown skill at reproducing global surface temperature anomalies over the 20th century. And for this quote, they provided cell B of figure 9.5, Again, it's a global surface temperature anomaly graph that compares the observations to the modeled output. And the model, in this case, only includes natural forcings. And those are solar variations and the responses of global surface temperatures to explosive volcanic eruptions. Is the third quote from the IPCC valid? It was with respect to the variations in global surface temperatures over the period of 1901 to 2005, and in it they pretty much said that in the first couple of decades global surface temperatures were flat, then they rose for a couple of decades, were flat again for a couple more decades, and then rose again towards the end of the 20th century on into 2005. Here we can see that the, from about 1901 to 1917, looking at the black curve, which is the observation-based data, global surface temperatures were flat. Then from 1917 to about 1945, global surface temperatures rose quite sharply. From 1945 to 1975-1976 the surface temperatures dropped or it was relatively flat again and then from 1976 to 2005 global surface temperatures were rising quite quickly. So claim number three or quote number three is valid. And that brings us to the last quote, which is the very interesting one that says, Modeling studies are also in moderately good agreement with observations during the first half of the 20th century when both anthropogenic and natural forcings are considered. The intent of that sentence, even though moderately good agreement is very vague, the intent is to reinforce that the models do a good job during the first half of the 20th century. But do they? What I've done with the figure 9.5, the graph of global surface temperature anomalies and the model outputs, is I've whited out, digitally whited out, the uh, distracting individual model run data, all those nice big yellow squiggles that surrounded the black and the red curves, the observational data and the multimodal mean data. And that gives you a different perspective of the graph. If we look at that early warming period, the observations appear to warm about three times faster than the multimodal mean during that early warming period. In order to confirm this, all we need to do is place some data in Excel that reproduces the global temperature anomaly curves presented by the observation and the model mean, and we can run some linear trend analysis and we can see how well the models match the observations during those two warming periods and during the two flat periods as well. I've left the modeled mean data as a red curve and I've used blue to in place of the black for the observational data 
and it's the Hadley Center's Hadcroup data. Same data that the IPCC used. So during the late warming period, the linear trends of the two data sets match quite well. They warmed at almost precisely the same rate. During the mid-century flat period, temperatures actually dropped a little bit, as they had said, and the models and observations match pretty well there too. And that's where the good things end. If we look at the early warming period, we can see that the surface temperature anomalies, the actual observed surface temperature anomalies, they rose at a rate that was more than three times faster than what the climate models said should have happened. And keep in mind that the climate models are being forced by the anthropogenic and natural forcings at that time. So global surface temperatures were more than happy to rise at a rate that's really comparable to the same rate as the latter warming period, but they weren't being forced to do so according to the IPCC's models. And it turns out the early w flat period really wasn't that flat. Temperatures actually dropped in the first 17 years, of, first 16 years, excuse me, of the 20th century. But the models showed that they should have risen as I noted earlier, the trends of the observational data for the two warming periods, those are comparable. The latter period warmed at a rate that was a little bit faster than the early warming period, but it's not that much different. But for the models, the anthropogenic forcing during the latter warming period drove it at a rate that was three times faster than the trend of the early warming period. Again, the model warming period trends are dictated by the natural and anthropogenic forcings. But the trends of the instrument-based observation data show little evidence of being dictated by natural and anthropogenic forcings. That is, unless you want to consider that slight increase in trend during the latter warming period as evidence of anthropogenic greenhouse gas warming. And what can we draw as a conclusion? The facts that the global temperature variations are only simulated by models that include anthropogenic forcings and only during the second half of the 20th century highlight a few of the many faults of the climate models used by the IPCC in AR4. In part two of this video series, we'll take a look at what causes that multi-decadal component in the global surface temperature anomaly data, and we'll determine its impact on this. We'll look at whether or not the results would be different if the IPCC had included the outputs of all of the climate models that were available to them. We'll see if the results would be different if only sea surface temperature data were included. The climate models produce sea surface temperature data as well, and the oceans cover 70% of the surface area of the globe. So it's important data to look at. We can look at what causes part of the early 20th century rise in surface temperature in the models. And we'll also confirm the importance of the multi-model mean. My blog post, The IPCC Says, the video, part one, includes links to the relevant summary for policymakers and chapters three and nine, which are the sources of the quotes and IPCC graphs used in the video. Also included are full-size versions of the graphs I prepared. Y'all have a good day.